Therefore, <clears throat> do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belonged to the world, do you submit to its rules? If you don't mind, I'm going to bow my head again just for one more word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for answering our prayers and for coming among us. And now we ask that our ears and our eyes may be open to hear and see what you have to say, Father. I open my mouth that you may use it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So... We're taken to Jerusalem in the Bible, down a small road going to the outskirts of the city. A crowd is gathered, and we see a man beaten and bruised carrying a cross. Now, unlike what we may think, this is not an uncommon sight in the city of Jerusalem, which, by the way, isn't a big city. It's very, very small by modern day standards. But it was quite common for the Roman officials to take a criminal and to hang them up on a cross outside the city as a symbol of what it means to defy Roman authority. The problem is that this man is innocent. And this man is the son of God. We all know this story. We're all well aware of the story of the cross. And yet it seems to be such a difficult place for Christians to return. The reason we have so much difficulty is found a few hours before this. In fact, the Thursday night before this, since this is happening on a Friday, we find Jesus going out into the Mount of Olives in Mark chapter 14. And we read this text. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended, of, be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. So first, Christ is telling his disciples right here, he's telling them that, Tonight, something is going to happen that's going to shake your faith. Something that's going to make you not want to be around me. You're going to scatter. You're going to flee like bugs. And Peter responds in the next verse, and he says, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. See, the problem with this whole story, as we'll find, is that we as human beings often think we know ourselves and we often think that we know one another, we know the future, we know what's going to happen. We think we have knowledge that we don't have. See, because just a few verses later in Mark chapter 14, verse 50, it says they all forsook him and fled. Just like that. A few hours had passed. One minute Peter's saying, I'll die for you. The next minute he's saying, I think I'm going to follow you from a distance. 
What is the point of all this? <clears throat> well, as I was studying and praying and thinking, a realization came to my mind, and that is that we as Christians, we talk a lot about many things, and we look at many things. We study doctrines. We study politics. We study the way the world works. We study how things are moving. We study sciences, and we come up with our own viewpoints of everything. <clears throat> and we seldom realize that God does not think the way we do, and that the future does not end up the way we suspect it will. See, Peter made a fatal mistake that night, and it's a mistake we all make. He made the mistake of thinking that he knew more than Jesus. This may be one of the reasons why we don't like to look at this story or look at the cross, because in the cross we only see human weakness. We don't see our own strength at all. We see Peter, we see the apostles all running, we see Judas having betrayed Christ, and only the Son of God himself is the only one who really knows what's going on, who has any idea of what's going on. So we find later on in that story that Peter had followed him afar off and he goes into the palace of the high priest and he's sitting next to the fire, warming himself. All of a sudden, we realize that, or he realizes that he's been discovered. Several people approach him and they start saying, you are the follower of that man. We all know this story. It's, it's something that we've probably been repeated to a thousand times. But there's a little, there's a little something interesting in it. And I'm going to try to find the text really quickly. There's a little something interesting where as, as Peter is betraying Christ the third time, the Bible tells us that Jesus looked on him. And as Jesus looks on Peter, Peter goes out and begins to weep. What was it that Peter saw? What was it that he saw in that look from Christ that changed his whole heart? That changed his way of thinking, even for a split second? If you go to the book of John with me, the book of John in chapter 3, we find the story of Nicodemus and Jesus. They're talking in the middle of the night because Nicodemus is a leader in Israel. And as we all know, when someone gets status or into a position of leadership, it becomes embarrassing for them to ask, to humble themselves enough to ask questions or to admit that they don't know something. And so he comes and sneaks to Jesus in the middle of the night. And... He comes really seeking approval, seeking to find out how he can get into the kingdom of God. But he comes first with flattery. He says, we know you are a teacher sent from God. And Jesus ignores his flattery and goes straight to the point. He says, you need to be born again. It almost seems, if you read the text, it almost seems like he's ignoring his first question entirely. But in reality, it's not true. You see, what Christ did multiple times is... When someone would ask a question, he would respond with what they actually wanted to know. Right? So the problem is, for instance, the disciples ask, Lord, increase our faith. And Christ does not respond with, okay, here's how you increase your faith. Instead, he answers, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, then you could say unto this tree, this sycamine tree, be moved and be cast into the sea, and it would be done. And you might be thinking, how is that an answer? Well, in truth, he was increasing their faith by the very thing he was saying. Because as we understand later on in the Bible, we find that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So instead of answering their question in the way that they expected him to, he actually gave them the gift of faith in his words. He increased their faith just by saying it. And so as we're sitting here with Nicodemus and Jesus... We get to a point in their dialogue where Nicodemus is listening to Christ and Christ is telling him about his mission on this earth. 
In John chapter 3, verse 14, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We all know that last verse. We all know John 3, 16. We always skip the verses right ahead or don't pay very much attention to them. But I would like to suggest today that the whole of God's message is found in John chapter 3, verse 14. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. There was a story in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, where we find out what this is all about. What is he talking about? Why is God bringing up, why is Jesus in this conversation with Nicodemus bringing up that he's going to be lifted up like Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness? Well, if you go there to Numbers 21 and you go to verse 4, it says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much, much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. They did not like the manna that God was giving them. And like many of us, when our circumstances aren't exactly the way we want them to be, because let's be honest, our circumstances are never quite as bad as some of the other people who are living on this planet. There's always someone who's doing worse than us. But when our circumstances don't meet our exact expectations, we do what they did, and we complain. And so the Lord became angry with them, and he sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. This is the point that I'm getting to. Jesus Christ calls himself this serpent that is lifted up. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so should he be lifted up. Whoever looked upon the serpent lived. And this is the message of the New Testament entirely. This is the message of the Old Testament. This is the message in its full sense. When we look at the sacrifices and the ceremonies of the Old Temple, we look at the Lamb who represents Christ. We look at the altar which represents His sacrifice. The whole children of Israel were saved multiple years, not because of following these rituals, but because if they really understood what they meant, then they knew and they saw Christ in these things. You see, the Spirit was talking to people long before the birth of Christ. And they all saw and they believed in Christ before that time. And even now, Jesus talking to Nicodemus, he's saying the same thing. He's saying, if you will look at me, you will live. I have a very difficult time remembering this, I think, sometimes. Because it's very easy to look at circumstances, to look at the world around you, to look at the way things play out, the way you feel, and to rely on these things as being some sort of sound and solid judgment. We are kind of like the apostles in that way. I think many of us probably believe in our hearts that we would never forsake God. But the truth is, the only thing that caused Peter to not entirely forsake God was that one glance. It was the thing that reminded him it was the Spirit of Christ that reminded him that he had told him this would happen. Why do you suppose God would tell Peter so many hours before it happened 
that he would betray him. And also he tells the entire apostles, you know, we, we always skip over the verse, but it says, so said they all. They all agreed with Peter in this premise. They all thought to themselves, this is, this is what we're going to do. We're going to stay with Jesus. We're going to be with him till the end. And then they all scatter in the end <laughs> when everything begins to look differently than how they expected it to. Jesus said this to Peter out of his own mercy. Because he knew that when Peter would remember this, <laughs> as we often remember that God tells us things, Peter would also remember that he was a dependent. That Peter could not do anything on his own and that his own ideas of himself were no good. The Bible tells us that our hearts are deceitful and exceptionally wicked. Who can know it, it asks. Of course, the answer to that is God only. It's not us. You know, I've been in so many circumstances in my life where I reacted totally different than I thought I would. You know, I think I would react very calmly and I reacted in a totally different way. Or I think I'm going to react very violently and yet I react very calmly. And you just, you know, as human beings, we don't know. We don't know how we're going to react. And yet we plan our lives based around our feelings and our reactions. We plan our lives based around what we think is true and what we think is false. We never know what is really going to happen. See, here's the truth, right? Everyone right now is terrified of this virus. They're terrified of the wars and rumors of wars, the earthquakes in diverse places, as God predicted in Matthew 24. But we fail to remember the parable of the rich man who had jumped. And one day he says, I'm going to build even more barns. And he starts to plan everything that he's going to do with you if you only knew <laughs> that tonight your soul will be required of you. You see, any of us can die at any time. We think it takes some catastrophic event, some earthquake or some disease or some... No, your soul could have been required of you at any point. In fact, I hear of it all the time. People my age just dropping dead like flies for... Who knows what reason? People getting hit by cars, or you could, you know, we talked about sinkholes, and anything can happen. We live in a world where the only containing factor is God. And so what we're really facing here is <laughs> Jesus is trying, he's trying to break Peter from his illusion of control. He, Peter believes he's in control. He thinks he knows Peter has his own agenda. He thinks he knows that the Roman government needs to be dealt with, <laughs> which they did, by the way. I mean, they were, they were a fairly corrupt government. You know, if you ever read what happens at the end of a triumph, the Roman triumph, their big parade, I won't go into details here about what happens, but they used to murder people <laughs> at the, right at the end of their parade as, as part of their celebration. It used to be part of their, uh, I guess you would say, it, it boosted the morale of the country to sacrifice people. But yet Christ did not address this. Christ instead addressed the heart of man. Because he realized that until the heart was changed, nothing around him would change. He also understood that as the Pharisees and Sadducees had already done, when you establish your own rule of righteousness and you think that you're doing the right thing, you often end up being overbearing, authoritative, dictatorial. So back to Peter now. In Luke 22, we see in verse 60, And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. It says that when Peter looked on Christ, Peter remembered the word of the Lord. John chapter 1 calls Jesus Christ this word. See, the two are really one. We've spent so much time looking at the theology and the technical aspects and the wording and the phrasing and the Greek and Hebrew thing relationship with the living being is what is being talked about in this book. 
Religion goes beyond the pages of the Bible. And it has to go into our lives. And as Christ said to Nicodemus in his conversation about being born again, he says, you have to look at me and live. So this is the message. God is continuously telling us, look and live. But now what is it that we see when we look? When we go to God daily, when we go to him to see him, to see his character, to see who he is, what is it that we see? In John chapter 1, we get an answer to that. Verse 29, John the Baptist is preaching, and he sees Jesus coming unto him, and he saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. When we see Jesus, we have to acknowledge him as our Savior. You see, so often we're afraid to be wrong, but if you're not in trouble, you don't need a Savior. And so you can't claim Christ to be your Savior unless you're, not in, tr- unless you're in trouble. It takes trouble. It takes you being in a position where you need help. And it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard position to put yourself in. I understand that. And I, I myself have a difficult time with it every day because you have to come there every day. We have to come to the foot of the cross every day. And sometimes, like Pilate, when we ask Jesus what is the truth, we don't even stand around and wait to hear what he has to say because it's just not that important to us. You see, the apostles... They were growing in a relationship with Christ. They had been with him for three and a half years now. And they had heard many of the things he had to say, but they had heard what they wanted to hear. Many of them never took the time to really hear what he was saying. Which is why when we get to the cross, they're so confused. right? We get to the cross and they don't realize that he's told them several times, I'm going to die, I'm going to the cross, and I'm going to be raised up again. But now we're looking at this, we're looking at this situation where, where Peter has denied Christ and he's forced to reconcile with the things that he hasn't wanted to hear. He's forced to reconcile with the fact that everything Christ has said has been true. And what begins to happen is what happens with many of us. A well of emotion comes up and we begin to feel disappointed and discouraged and We feel, even in our own selves, we feel guilty. Let us not forget that Christ prayed for Peter that his faith wouldn't fail. It was the loving and compassionate Christ that he saw when he looked at him. See, Christ wasn't mad. When he saw Christ, he saw the lamb. He saw that Christ was willing to go through this for his sake. You see, when the Romans had come, or rather the chief priests had come, with their mob in the middle of the night to get, to get Christ. Christ said, take me, only leave them alone. And he said this so that it might be fulfilled that of all the people that were his, he had lost none. Christ, even at this moment, being captured by the high priest, his own people, and being taken, his first thought was for them. When we look at Christ, it is difficult because we know our own deficiencies. Right? Like day by day, we understand we're, when we're looking at Christ, when we see him, you begin to see that you're more flawed than you thought you were. Your Christian experience just maybe isn't what you thought it was. Your connection with God could be a bit stronger. Because what you begin to see is that God in Jesus Christ poured out the entirety of heaven in one gift. In giving us Jesus Christ, God gave us himself. And then Jesus Christ, in giving us the Holy Spirit, gives us himself again. Repeatedly, God is giving himself to us so that we can embrace him, so that we can receive the gifts and the joy of heaven. But the problem is, like Laodicea of old, when Christ comes by with support, when he says, look, I see that you're poor. I see that you're miserable. I see that you're naked. Here, take these clothes from me. Take this gold. Take this eye salve. 
we say, I don't need it. Because we've been raised that way. You know, if you were raised anything like me, then being guilty meant being wrong. It meant being lost. But let us not forget that God died on a cross that day for the guilty. He died for us. When we are at our lowest, we have to remember that this is when Christ is at his best. This is why Paul says that he glories in his infirmities and his physical weaknesses because he said that when he is weak, Christ is able to be strong in him. This is the idea that I'm getting at. We can look at everything else. We can try to figure everything else out. We can try to figure each other out, which is rarely ever right, at least in my case. You know, I look at people and there's always prejudices and imaginations and thoughts that come through your head. And you think you're so right until you find out that you're terribly, terribly wrong. That maybe you shouldn't look at people from the eyes that you see with. John chapter 18, verse 38, we read what I spoke just a moment ago of Pilate. In, in John, let's see, yeah, it's John chapter 18, verse 38. It says, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find no fault at all. So what happened? <laughs> For a second he was interested in Christ. And then, right away, he jets. <laughs> he doesn't stop to even hear. Does that sound like any of us? I know it sounds like me sometimes. I'm, I get up a little late in the morning. <laughs> and sometimes I'll say a prayer. And as I'm saying my prayer, I almost don't even recognize myself getting up off my knees. I'm already going to do everything else. I just, it was passive. It was just a form. And I think that's the way so many of us pray. Which is, it's the way the Pharisees prayed in the, in the time of Christ. And that is, are we really trying to commune and hear the voice of God or do we rush from one point to another? See, because there are so many divisions among the people of God. There's so many different idea sets. There's so many different ways of thinking about things. It, it puzzles me how I could have ever thought that that could be resolved without Jesus. But that's the way we feel. We feel like we can resolve it. We enter in debates and arguments and pointless delineations of different things. And yet at the bottom of it is Christ. And yet we call ourselves Christians. We bear his name. We say that we represent him and that we love him. But he said that the sign that would show that we loved him was our love for one another. Please don't think I'm being critical because I apply this to myself as well. We all need the saving grace of Christ. And he came to bring that to us. Pilate didn't really care what the truth was. It wasn't important enough to take up his time. His aspirations as a leader in a position of power eclipsed the importance of Christ. He was, more, he was more concerned with whether or not he was going to stay in power after that day. Whether or not the Jews were going to riot and he would have to deal with this situation. An innocent man dying never crossed his mind. And furthermore, that fact that that man was the son of God and came to bring truth never had weight on his mind. He was like the seed cast on the wayside where the birds quickly came and gathered it up. The word never made an impression on his heart because he never stopped to look at it. Had he stopped to look, perhaps it would have ended differently. 1 Corinthians 2.8 says, Had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But in 1 Corinthians, it's talking about the princes of this world. And of course, because we are the princes of this world, because we feel that we have some power or prestige or responsibility, Jesus becomes less important. I'm not here to decry any of you for not spending time with Christ. What I am extending is an invitation. 
You see, in Matthew 27, Jesus has been on the cross for quite some time now. And from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there is, there is darkness covering the land. And around the ninth hour, Jesus lets us into his thought process as he hangs there for our sins. He says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, as far as my understanding goes, in those times, very often a rabbi would read the beginning of a scripture. And it was expected that the congregation listening under the sound of his voice would repeat the rest of the chapter below it. This chapter is Psalms 22. I'm going to turn there really quickly. I'm going to be brief with it. But what else was Christ thinking on the cross at that moment? So we hear the words here in verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. And now we get to where his thoughts, his thoughts to do what ours don't in this situation. And this is why we need him. It says, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and they were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. And he comes back to himself. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And again, he turns back to hope. <laughs> but thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I cast upon thee, I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. He is dependent on God in these moments. In absolute darkness, when for hours physical and mental darkness covered the whole earth, Yet Christ is dependent on his father's promises. He is counting on what he has done for those before. He said that our fathers depended on you. And so he's, he's recalling the children of Israel. He's recalling everything that God has done in the past and saying, you have proven yourself to me. This is why we need Jesus, because we can't do this. Not on a cross, <laughs> hanging between two thieves after being half beaten by the people we came to save. We can't do this. But you'll notice that as we read and as we talk of Jesus and as we see who he is, our hearts become softer. The spirit begins to work on us and a change begins to be seen. Because the Bible says, by beholding, we become changed. And so it's at looking. It's looking at this cross, at this low moment, at this moment of low worth in our eyes, of absolute failure in the eyes of man that we become changed into the likeness and into the hope of Jesus Christ. You see, at the end of the chapter, and this is where we had our, one of our scripture readings, it was the call to worship. In verse, let's start with verse 27. It says, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down into the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him, and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and declare his righteousness unto the people that shall be born, that he hath done this. See, this is what happens when we look. We become the seed. When we allow the word to come into our hearts, when we allow Jesus into our hearts. See, when we study the Bible, it's not for debate or for strife. 
As Isaiah says, he says that you fast for debate, for strife. You don't go to God really wanting to know who he is. But this is the promise. That when we choose to see Christ as he really is, he will come in and dwell with us. And we will be that generation that declares his righteousness. That tells the people what he has done. What he has done for us. Colossians chapter 2, which was the scripture reading for the day, had a very interesting thing in it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. I'm sure many, many of us being raised Adventists are aware of this scripture and we know the meaning. Start verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them, openly triumphing over them. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. You know, we read this text so often and we go straight to, you know, Deuteronomy 31, 26, the law that was written against us. We know that this is the book of the law. We know this is talking about the ceremonial Sabbaths. But we miss why Paul actually wrote this. You see, the people in Paul's day didn't have a problem keeping the Sabbath or any of those types of things. They had a problem thinking that their traditions and ways were salvation. And Paul is just trying to remind them of something. That everything that was done in verse 17 was pointing to Jesus. Everything that was done in the old and everything that's done in the new is pointing to Jesus. You see, Jesus lived the law. And while we talk about the law, we, we often are able to separate it from him because we're not talking about the law. We're talking about our ideas and our um, viewpoints. But to understand the real law, the real character of Christ, we have to look at him, his actions, his motives, what drove him. How did he enforce or not enforce the law? Where did he have mercy? And so Paul is saying here in verse 20, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? You see, the word rudiments in 1828, Noah Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, a rudiment is a first or principal thing. It is the thing that comes first. We use the word rudimentary. It is the first thing that needs to be taught. Rudimentary math, addition, subtraction. Rudimentary to reading. We have to understand grammar. We have to understand sentence structure. Comprehension. Rudimentary to this world is our way of thinking. The ways of thinking, Paul says, we have to get rid of. When we die with Christ, these ways of thinking go away. And we think sometimes that that means a sinful way of thinking. Or perhaps that means, you know, our viewpoint of the Bible. No, what it means is that the way you think is not the way God thinks. That you are a human being and that our earthly way of thinking is skewed because we are human beings. And so again, what does he say though? He says, if you be dead with Christ, it brings us right back to the cross again. Every single time we're coming to a text, we come back to the cross. We come back to Christ. We come back to this point where... We're looking and we're living. You see, the law is not void. It is as alive as you can ever believe it to be. The sacrifice that proves that the law is alive is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. It proves that the law cannot be changed. But that same sacrifice proves That God was willing to take the penalty for the law. For us. You see, we aren't condemned 
because we don't keep the law or because we don't go to church or don't follow some ritualistic form. John chapter 3 says, we are condemned in that light. When light is coming to the world, we love darkness rather than light. You know, we always think choose darkness. No, it says loved. Because by beholding Christ, we begin to love him. Why? The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. So if we stop looking at that love every day, if we stop examining that, then our love will not show forth either. The prophet Isaiah declares, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In chapter 54, Isaiah goes on. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? You see, Isaiah is just, he's in awe at the fact that he's been telling people about Jesus. He's been telling people about what God's power is, his salvation. And in Isaiah and these old prophets, we have to remember their only view of Jesus, the only thing they could see was either in visions or by looking at the law that was written in the time of Moses. Isaiah didn't have the prophets to read because Isaiah was the prophet. (laughs) Isaiah didn't have the, the entire Old Testament in a collection because the scribes had to gather that together. Isaiah obviously didn't have the writings of the New Testament because if he did, I mean, he would have had to live at least that long, and that's not possible. But he sees Jesus by looking at these things because when he looks at the word, he doesn't just see words on a page. He sees something that can be appropriated to him. He sees that every promise, every word that God spoke to Moses was spoken to him. He sees that this word is a love letter to him from God. And so it's no longer a dead thing. It's no longer just thou shalt and thou shalt not. It's this is the way the Lord lives. This is his personality. You know, when we act this way, it hurts him. In the same way it would hurt anyone in a relationship if you constantly did everything that they don't like. And now we're able to consider these things. And Isaiah is now being able to say, Lord, you have been righteous And no one is believing that you are here to help us. No one believes my word. It says, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was just a normal-looking person. Would we have esteemed him? Would we have accounted him? He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. See, when we look at the cross, we see failure. We think that if we're in a certain economic position, if we're in a certain physical position, if we're hurt, if we're imprisoned, if we have to go through these things, we suspect that God does not love us. And yet when we look at the cross, we remember that this world is a cruel place and that the Son of God himself could not escape the trouble that was here, but bore it willingly for us that we could have hope and peace when we go through it. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. 
such an odd phrase. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Does God love you that much? That even his own suffering is pleasant to him to save you. That one thing makes it worth it to him. It says, he hath put him to grief, or sorry, yeah, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So Isaiah is here prophesying that Christ will remember Psalms 22 and he will remember that a generation will come to serve him. He will see this seed in his mind and physically at the end of the world when he comes to see us. He will see his seed and he will get his reward. In verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many? For he shall bear their iniquities. We have so many different problems with doubt, with fear, with sin. The Bible says that he that feareth loveth not God, or is not made perfect in love, rather. For God is love. In 1 John chapter 2, we understand that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, because of this. But in chapter 3, verse 6, we read something interesting. It says to us that, sorry, I'm stumbling trying to think of how to express this very clearly, but it says to us that all of our problems come from not knowing Jesus and not looking into his face. And that may be different from the way that you read that chapter, right? When we read John chapter three, verse six, we read, If you don't keep the commandments, or if you don't do the way I think you should do, or if you're not righteous the way that I am, and I mean, if we're all honest, we're all self-righteous sometimes. It just happens. It's natural. It's part of our nature. But when we look to Jesus, we realize it says, he that sinneth hath not seen him. All the problems with sin we have in our life, which cause all the other problems we have in our life. They all come from having not seen him or known him. You see, when Christ comes at the end of the world, he said he will will set his sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left hand. And it says he will say to them, have you kept my commandments? Is that what it says? It says, have you been a good Sabbath keeper? God's standard of righteousness is quite different than ours. You see, those things we all do out of a heart of service and love for God. The proofs that we are Christians is our love for God and our love for man. He says, when I was in prison, you visited me. He said, when I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked and you clothed me. And he said, if we had done it to the least of these, my brethren... You have done it to me. See, Christ's standard of righteousness, his life of the law was quite different than ours. But as we look to him, we see hope. It's an invitation. It's by looking at him, by seeing how wretched we are in our own righteousness, by looking at him and seeing our own failures and seeing our own disgrace and our own failed consequences and bad choices, we can look to him and now we can say, Father, be my righteousness. Be my strength. And by beholding, we we can have the faith and assurance that we will become changed into his likeness. Amen.